Father, we thank you for this, another opportunity to minister to these, your precious sheep. Thank you, Lord, that revelation knowledge will flow freely, uninterrupted and unhindered by any satanic or demonic force. And Father, I pray that you will speak through my vocal cords. Mm, God, think through my mind. None of me, all of you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Praise God. You can be seated. If you have your Bibles, go with me to the book of Romans chapter 11 and verse 6. I'm going to read it in the King James, the NIV, and the Amplified. But I want to start off with a, uh, I want to establish this with a statement. Uh, it's taken a lot of years to, to, to understand how to articulate what we're going to uh, deal with uh, this morning. We're going to talk about what it means to fall from grace. But there's some things we have to establish first. And the only way I know how to do it is through the Scripture and through the Word of God that we believe. What, did, what it means to fall from grace. We've talked about this in times past, uh, and it just gets bigger and bigger. So I want to start off by saying this. I, I, read, I read this uh, statement that grace cannot be grace if making Christ Lord is made a condition for receiving eternal life. And that, 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 would, that weirded me out, like, okay, wait, wait, there's a whole lot going on here. And literally spent days just meditating on it, fighting it, disagreeing with it, wondering about it. I, at one time, I even called it heresy. <laughs> I said, this, this, is, this is, no. And I was getting ready to work out one day last week. I walked in and I told Minister Ken, I said, listen, I said, I got something that I've been trying to say, but I don't know how to say it. And then in, what, a few seconds, I understood how to say it. <laughs> you know how Jesus walked in and he said to his mother, my time has not come yet, and then it came, and he turned water into wine. Here's what it says. Here's what I believe is going on here. Grace cannot be grace if there is a condition for receiving it. Grace cannot be grace if there is a condition for receiving it. No human effort or performance empowers grace. And yet, we've gone to churches where we think that God's power is based on our behavior. We've gone to churches where we think, well, you know, I'm going to show you the behavior so you can reap the benefits of his power. And oh, yeah, by the way, and if you don't do this, then it's going to short circuit his power. And I am saying to you that God's power is not based on your behavior, good or bad. God's grace is not based on what you do. No matter how many times I say that, there are still Christians trying to figure out what to do. What we do is we believe Jesus and we learn how to let him go ahead of us and we yield to him and what we do is whatever he leads us to do as a result of yielding to him. But we don't do something to try to get him to do something good to us. We don't do good in order to get good. Grace is not based on your salvation, but your salvation is based on grace. Now, this is the big part where church is concerned. Somehow, now that we're all saved and buttoned up real nice, we think that the grace of God is available to us because we are saved, but then that would then be put in a condition on grace. The grace of God is not based on your salvation. Your salvation is based on the grace of God. You were saved, Ephesians chapter 2 and 8, you were saved by grace through faith. 
Your salvation did not make grace available. You were saved by grace. Grace was given, and then the, the beauty of the gift of grace provided all of these things for you who believe. Does everybody follow me here? Because we get into church and we think, oh, that, ain't, that can't happen because you ain't saved. God ain't going to forgive you because you ain't saved. There's no way you can prosper because you ain't saved. How many of y'all remember when you were raised in hell that you bumped into some goodness of God, and you, when you was raised in hell, you bumped into some goodness? And it convicted you. You're like, I don't even know how that happened. I, I want to take you through the Scripture, and I want to show you that grace was extended to the whole world even people who had yet received him. Grace was given to me before I believed, before I got saved. Grace was given to a fallen world. Are, are y'all following me here? All right, let's, let's go through these real quick. Yeah, uh, Romans 11, verse 6 in the King James NIV and, and Amplified. I, I want to spend a little special time with this. King James says, but if by grace, then it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more work. So if you did something to get it, grace ain't involved. You earned that. That's yours. Look at it in the next uh, translation, uh, NIV. And, by, and if by grace, then it cannot be based on works. If by grace, it cannot be based on works. If it were, grace would no longer be grace. Wow. And then they amplified. But if it is by grace, his unmerited favor and graciousness, it is no longer conditioned on works or anything men have done. Otherwise, grace would no more or no longer be grace, it would be meaningless. Wow. Come on, while we're in the Scriptures, let's move through it. 1 John chapter 2, verse 1 through 2. I want you to see what Jesus did for people that were not saved. I, I, I want you to see what people did for the world, for the whole world. 1 John chapter 2 and uh, verse 1. My little children, these things write unto you that you sin not. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he is the propitiation. He is the ransom that was paid for you. He is the peace offering that was paid for you. He is the compensation. That's what propitiation means. He's the comp compensation for all of your sins. He's the sin offering for all of your sins. So we're thinking, well, this is just talking about church people. He says, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world that ain't even saved. Are you following me? Everybody on the bus? St. John chapter 129, stay on the bus. We, we got a ways to travel now. St. John 129. The next day, John seeth Jesus coming unto him, and he saith, here's what John, John the Baptist says. He says, Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the whole world. Here is the torment of going to hell. Going to hell when all of your sins have been taken away from you, and the only reason you went is because you wouldn't receive the gift. You know how tormented that is? For you to get to hell when Jesus has taken away the sins of the whole world, not the sins of those of you who got saved. You think your sins were dealt with when you just got saved, and they were, but he said he came to take away the sins. This was made available to everybody in the world. Everybody in the world has had their sins taken away but the only reason you go to hell because you won't believe in the one who took them away. I know this sounds strange. Come on, stay with me. Romans 5 and 8. Romans 5 and 8. A seminarian in here is going to freak out today. 
You may try to pull your hair out by the time I finish. No, no, no. It's like, yes, yes, yes. But God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners. What happened? When, when, did, when did he die for you? When you was a sinner. He, he did what he did when you and I were sinners. He didn't do what he did when y'all got born again, start talking in tongues, and start treating folks right. He died for you while you were a no good for nothing, hell raising, holy sinner. <laughs> he didn't need nothing from you for him to make that available. He said, I'm going to make it available, then I'm going to work on you to see if I can get you to receive it. <laughs> Come on. Titus chapter 2 and 11. <clears throat> Titus chapter 2 and 11. This is interesting here. For the grace of God, look what grace brought, that bringeth salvation. Salvation didn't bring grace. The grace of God that bringeth salvation hath appeared to world changers, folks, only. For, for talking in tongues, people, only. The grace of God has appeared unto all men. So everybody on the planet has access to this gift of grace. It's appeared to every man. Unfortunately, not every man has received it or accepted it yet. But every man, there is no man that will ever come on this planet that grace has not been made available to him. St. John chapter 1 and 9. St. John chapter 1 and 9. Dog, I feel like we in class. What is this? <laughs> that was the true light. Now, the context here is John the Baptist was baptizing, and he was talking that Jesus is the true light and that he's just the witness of the light. And he said in verse 9, that was the true light which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Every man has access to this light. Every man. Hebrews chapter 2 and 9. Hebrews chapter 2 and 9. Are you getting, are you getting where I'm taking you right now? You, you, you understand this? Verse 9 says, but we see Jesus who was made a little lower than Elohim. That's God. The, he, the Greek word there is Elohim, a little lower than Elohim, for the sufferings of death, crowned with glory and honor, that he, by the grace of God, should taste death only for church people. For every man. And then finally, John 17 and 3. John 17 and 3. <clears throat> and this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and that they might know Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. This is eternal life, to know Jesus. That's eternal life to know Jesus. The day you get born again, you have stepped into eternal life. We relate to eternal life as how, the, 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 the unlimited time or something. No, no. We're, we're, Jesus is eternal. Yeah. Jesus is life eternal for those who have received him, and eternal life has been extended to every man. The world cannot know grace as long as they find sufficiency and merit in man's efforts, in man's works, in man's performance. You cannot know grace if you keep trying to earn what cannot be earned, and grace cannot be earned. There is no seven steps to earn grace. 
If, if you have seven steps to earn grace, it's not grace that you're earning. You're earning maybe a paycheck, you're earning maybe something, but you're not earning grace because it, it cannot be earned. It is a gift that could only be presented by the eternal perfection of the Lord Jesus Christ. It, grace could only be given by someone who has that. It was God, the Word, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God, and the Word became flesh, and the Word that became flesh delivered grace and truth to a bunch of people who didn't deserve it. And you've received a gift, if you've received it, a gift is available to you who don't deserve it. And the, one of the reasons why people are not saved right now is because religion has put so many qualifications and conditions on Jesus. And I'm telling you, it's a lie. If you put conditions on grace, and I say Jesus now because grace is not a principle. It is a person. Jesus full of grace and truth. So when I talk grace, I'm not talking about a subject matter. I'm not talking about a curriculum matter. I'm talking about a person. So every time you see Jesus doing anything, that's grace. Grace showed up, wrapped up in flesh to present to fallen man, something he can't earn or deserve. Grace showed up to say, I ain't going to do for you what you cannot do. I'm going to give to you what you cannot earn. And I'm going to take you to a place you cannot go without me. And all I want you to do just believe it. And you keep saying, I believe. But then, you know, God helps those who help themselves. All right, grace has ceased. You won't know grace now because you keep going back to something you have to do to deserve it. And that freaks church minds out because you got to do something. You got to do something. And then you go to the, to the obvious thing. Well, well, what about this? Do you just sit around? No, you don't sit around. You trust God, and then you trust God to show you what to do. You trust God, and you trust God to lead and guide you. You trust God. That's the, our life is a life of trusting God. It's not a life of let me come up. I got five things I know I can do to get myself, get God to do something good for me. And then if the good should happen because of grace, and at the same time you did three or four things, you're going to give credit to the three or four things that you gave. That's why he said, don't boast. You were saved by grace, not of yourself. It's a gift of God. So you can't boast about a gift of God because you didn't do nothing to get the gift of God. But we got, li listen carefully in church. There's a lot of boasting. A lot of boasting, boasting about what you did in the prayer closet, boasting about, you know, what you gave, and, and hard, hard, hard. you ought to do like I do. That's where it's getting to. Do like I do. If you would give like I give, then you have the business like I have. And I know people who are giving better than you giving, and they still ain't got what you got because it is not predicated on your effort. <laughs> if, if, if you understand if you understand that, say, say amen. amen. Man's resources ends when that happens, provision to satisfy man's need begins. Let's look at the first miracle in John chapter 2. First miracle in John chapter 2 verse 3 and then 7 and 9. Verse 3 and then 7 through 9. All right, now watch this. Here's the miracle. You remember that, the water, the wine. And when they wanted wine, the mother of Jesus said unto him, they have no wine. Something happens when you have no more performance. Look what happened, verse 7 through 9. 
Of course, Jesus responded to the closest person to him and said, uh, he, said he said to his, his mother, woman, that ain't none of our business. <laughs> Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots. Now, at least Mary was wise enough to say, all right, it might not be none of my business, but whatever he tell you to do. And that's the way of grace. That's what we should be doing now as Christians. Well, what do you do? Whatever he tells you to do. Well, I can't hear him. We'll spend more time with him. You not hearing him is not an excuse for you to go on and try to perform, so you've created your own method of how to walk with Christ. Jesus said unto them, fill the water pots with water, and they filled them up to the brim. And he says unto them, draw out now and bear unto the governor of the feast. And then they bear it out, did everything he said. When the ruler of the feast, I tell you what, it's, it's important to do what God says. I'm just thinking about the time when we had a Friday night service over in the school where we had our church started, and in the middle of the service, God said, go to Atlanta Baptist, which was that chapel over there, and say this to them. And I went over there, and I said what God told me to say, and then they came out of their meeting, and they said, how would you like to move in on Thanksgiving? What if I went and did that? What if I thought, well, now I'm going to get my lawyers together, and I'm going to get them? I already had them. I, I had this lady for two years. She couldn't get no money nowhere, selling bonds and stuff. It wasn't working. Well, we didn't qualify for nothing. We were too young and too broke to qualify for anything. It was going to take a miracle. I went to CNS Bank. Anybody remember the CNS Bank? I went to CNS Bank down the street. I told the lady, I said, I need a loan. After God told me, don't borrow no money. And I went in there, I'm, I'm going to help him out. He, he don't know I'm in the physical world and we need, we need a loan. We, we can't be Shaka Zulu in here. Ain't these people ain't, these, 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 these black folks ain't been on Shaka Zulu here. You got to get some money. And I went out there and I said, ma'am, you know, I need money. She said, she said, uh, looked at the record. She said, ooh, you don't qualify for nothing. And I said, I mean, not even, not even $5? I ain't qualified for nothing. And she, and she said, you ain't never going to get this money for this. And she did something to me. And I stood up over her desk and I said, you watch and see. Now, wait, 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 wait. I had to go through all of that. And then I said, all right, Lord, we'll do it your way. Don't, don't have to be turned down by the world before you back up and finally submit to God. Amen. And when the ruler of the feast had tasted this wine, water that was made wine and knew not whence it was, but the servants which drew the water they knew, and the governor of the feast called the bridegroom, look what he said, saith unto him, every man at the beginning does set forth good wine, and when men have well drunk, then they, which is worse, but thou hast kept the good wine until now. Isn't it something that they had to run out of their supply before they could encounter God's supply? So while you're sitting there continuing to try to help God out with your effort and performance, you know what God's doing? Waiting until you run out. <laughs> waiting until you come to an end of yourself, waiting until you run out of all your ideals, waiting until your, your, your education gets dried up. He's waiting until all of that happens. And when it all runs out, then if you listen to him carefully, he'll tell you what to do, and he's going he gonna, to he gonna release his supply in your life. A lot of Christians don't get no God supply because they're more confident in their own supply. I pray for you, church, that you run out of your supply. God, help me to run out of my supply. Help me to run out of my ideas unless they come from you. Help me to run out of my performance unless it's something you told me to do. And I watch this. Look at John 6, 28 in the NLT. John 6, 28 and 29 in the NLT. Well, brother, I don't know what to do. I mean, what, what you supposed to do? Well, I tell you what you're not supposed to do. 
you're not supposed to try to get grace to operate through your effort, your performance, and your works. What am I supposed to do? Well, Jesus tells us here. They had just seen the miracle of the bread and the, uh, uh, the fish and the bread multiply. And they replied, we want to perform God's works. That's the whole church right there. They want to perform God's works. They said, what should we do? Pretty good question. Jesus told them, this is the only work God wants from you. Believe in the one he has sent. And that's hard for church folks to get. Believe in the one that he has sent. Well, what's happening while I believe in him? Philippians 2, 13 in NLT. Philippians 2, 13 in the NLT. For God is working in you. Say, say, God's working in me. Working in say it again, God's working in me. Working in what is he doing? He's giving you the desire and the power to do what pleases him. Say it again, God's working in me. So what is, is, exactly is he working on? He's working on your desires. He's working on changing your desires. Because the things you do, most of the time you're doing because of the desire you have. So God says, I'm going to change your desire, and you're going to want to do what pleases me. And right now, you might not want to do what pleases him. You might want to do what pleases you. He's working on your desire. Believe him. He's working on the desire. He's working on the desire so you can now trust your heart. Maybe it was hard for you to trust your heart before you got saved, but now that you're saved and you have a new creation in you, and you have this desire to do something that's born out of that new heart, you can trust it. Oh, wow, I really have a desire to work with children. And, and you can, you say, well, what's the will of God? Well, trust your heart. You, the will of God just came out of your heart. It just, you can trust it now. Before, you couldn't trust it. A, a lot of you have these, the will of God's coming out of your heart, of that new creation, telling you what to do, telling you what to go, and you won't do it because you're you scared. You want to hear something through your head, and he speaks through your heart. Yeah. And you can trust your heart if you, you can, you can trust your heart. It's not in your heart for no reason at all. It's in your heart because you're now born again. It's in your heart because the old man has been removed and the new man is on the inside. It's, it's in, in your heart because you, you want to please God. It's in your heart because you believe in Jesus. It's in your heart because you're renewing your mind. And then out, it, out of your heart, the will of God comes, and you can trust it. You don't need to go and please God. Well, if that's really the truth, I can't tell you, I went to God the other week and I, apolog I, I apologized and then and still asking for a fleece. I said, Lord, I apologize, but I done confused myself. <laughs> Anybody ever did that? I done confused myself. Now, I thought you said turn right. I went right, but I went halfway. Then I went back and turned left. And then I went to my heart after I did all of that. And then, and then I thought my heart was saying this, I, I need a fleece. Somebody said, what do you mean? Well, God, if you want me to do that, then let that happen. And if that don't happen, then I know. <laughs> don't look at me like you ain't never did that. <laughs> and then I looked back. There were some things in my heart, and it happened, and I didn't do it. And the reason why I didn't do it, because I had something else in my heart. Bitterness. Bitterness is unforgiveness that has simmered. You forgot it was there. Now, I'm setting you up for the answer to the question, what does it mean to fall from grace? But you got to understand how this thing works in relationships. Let's look at one more, and we'll, 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 we'll get busy answering that question. Ephesians 1, 5 through 6 in the NLT. Ephesians 1, 5 through 6 in NLT. So you can trust your heart. You're born again. You're seeking God. He's changing your, check it. Go back, if you will, 
And, and somebody says, well, did, did God give you the fleece? No, you know that. <laughs> I was just seeing if he might have was feeling generous today. He, he, I'm not doing that. It just indicated I needed to grow some more. <laughs> Look at this. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family. And when God adopts us, it's not us having different DNA than him. He adopts us as adult children with the same DNA. He adopts us into his own family by bringing us to himself, how through Jesus Christ, this is what he wanted to do, and, he gave, and it gave him great pleasure to do it. So, we praise God for the glorious grace he has poured out on us who belong to his dear son. I praise God for the glorious grace that's been poured out on me because I received it. Many have yet to receive it. Every man has gotten it, but many have not yet received it. Now, what does it mean to fall from grace? And you'll see why we had to do that first. Go to Hebrews chapter 12, verse 14 through 17. Hebrews 12, verse 14 and 17. All right, watch very carefully now. All right, put your thinker on. No, do that in the King James. Hebrews 12, 14 in the King James. He said, follow peace with all men and holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, colon. It's not complete yet, right? You got to read the other side of the colon, what he's talking about. So, so far he said, follow peace with all men, follow holiness, without no man shall see the Lord. And a lot of guys, guys like to see that and say, see there, see there, you got to be holy if you're going to see God. You got to be holy if you're going to see God. Read the whole thing. <laughs> follow peace with all men and holiness, for without no man will receive the Lord, see the, see the Lord. Colon, finish the thought, looking diligently, lest any man fail of the grace of God. If you look somewhere in your Bible, the Greek translation here is, if any man fall from the grace of God. Look diligently, lest any man fall from the grace of God. Lest any root of bitterness springing up trouble you, and thereby many be defiled, semicolon, still ain't finished, lest there be any fornication or profane person as Esau, who for one morsel of meat sold his birthright. Now, here's what he's saying. This verse doesn't end with a period. Verse 14. It ends with a colon. It goes on to say, looking carefully that you don't, you don't fall from the grace of God. So the way to pursue peace and the way to walk in holiness is to make sure you don't fall from the grace of God. If you're going to pursue peace, don't fall from the grace of God. Because to pursue peace, you better have the grace of God. How many of you have, tr have tried to pursue peace in your own effort and it got worse? He said, don't fall from the grace of God if you're going to pursue peace. And don't fall from the grace of God if you're going to pursue holiness. Because you're not going to be able to pursue holiness or peace if you fall from the grace of God. It's going to take the grace of God to pursue holiness and peace. You're going to need the grace of God to pursue holiness and to pers and pursue peace. So sometimes, like I said, they make it sound like you don't have holiness. Uh, you, you, if you don't have holiness, you're going to go to hell. And not knowing that the gospel says that if, if it's not a matter of holiness, 
but it's a matter of do you believe the gospel. It's a matter of, uh, of the good news about Jesus Christ on the cross. It's a matter about shedding the blood, now, uh, shedding, the shedding of his blood. Now, notice what he says here. If you want to pursue peace, if you want to pursue holiness, don't fall from the grace of God. Because if you fall from the grace of God, that's what he said, less any, if you do this, this will happen. If you fall from the grace of God, a root of bitterness will spring up. <coughs> spring up, which lets you know this is going to be a process. Bitterness don't let you know it's there until later. Somebody did something to you, and you being religious, say, I forgive you, but it didn't, you didn't really, you didn't really deal with that. It was still there simmering. And if you ever want to find out if that's true, if that issue come up in an argument, it ain't been dealt with. It's still there. How many times you going to bring that up? It's saying you, it's still there. And, and the problem with it still being there, and, you don't, and you're falling from grace, see, you're falling from grace. Oh, let's see. Let me see. Let me see. Okay, let me just say this, and then I can define what it means to fall from grace, you'll understand. But when you fall from grace, pursuing peace is going to become a challenge. Walking holy is going to become a challenge because you need grace to walk holy because you, you, you're imperfect. You're not going to be able to do that without the grace of God. But also, a root of bitterness will come in. And you look up one day, and your wife has committed adultery. Somebody said, that just happened. No, it did. That's been simmering the whole time. And if you don't restore your position in grace, a manifestation of bitterness will be the results. A lot of people don't understand this trick of the devil, fall from grace, root of bitterness, manifestation of, because what bitterness says is you hurt me and I'm going to do something to hurt you back. Now, let's look at what it is. Uh, go to Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. Galatians chapter 5, verse 4. Okay. All right, y'all, let's dig. Ready? Christ is become of no effect. Who in the world wants to hear that? When you're sick, no effect. We're in trouble. Christ has become of no effect. That's the one I'm supposed to depend on. Christ has become of no effect. Whosoever of you are justified by the law, you are fallen from grace. Now, what we have heard on television and on the news is when somebody falls into sin, they, they, the topic is such and so, such and so fell from grace because they fell into sin. The truth is, is when you fall into sin, you just fell into grace. Or they potentially. To fall from grace means that you fall back into trying to be justified by the law. Or you fall back into your self-effort. You fall back into depending on your performance. You fall back in depending on your works. He said, Christ has become of no effect of you. Why? He can't have effect in your life. Why? Because you think that you can. You have fallen from grace because you have fallen back to your old way. You have fallen back to trying to do things on your own. You have fallen back to trying to accomplish things on your own. You have fallen from grace when you go back into trying to perform and trying to get God to perform based on your performance. You've fallen from grace, and Christ can't have no effect. 
You've fallen for grace because you've got 10 things to do to deal with this, but Christ says that can have no effect. You see, when you work to try to make something happen, you deserve the, the, the payment for it. What it is, is you went to work and you deserve to pay. But if Christ will do it, you can't work. You've fallen from grace. So now you're operating in your religion trying to figure out why you ain't having no effect, why nothing's working, why this ain't happening. We want to go out and operate in the flesh, and we want to go out and perform, and then after we finish performing, oh, God bless this. You know what happens? He can't. And you're blaming it on Jesus ain't real. No, you have chosen to be justified by the law, by works, by performance, and when you do that, Christ has no effect. Somebody says, no, the reason why Christ doesn't have an effect is because of sin. <laughs> That's all they do. Sin. Sin is the reason why you didn't get the promotion. I lost some weight so my cheeks don't jiggle like they used to. <laughs> sin. Sin. The reason why that business idea didn't work, sin, sin. Sin is the reason why uh, you, you're having problems with your children. Sin is the reason why you're having problems in your marriage. Sin, sin. And I want to say to old shaky jaws, well, why you got problems? Is it sin? If it is sin, and I'll show you in a minute, how come Jesus was able to go to certain villages full of sinners and heal everybody in the village? Well, nobody saved because he had not yet died and been made racist. <laughs> Testing, okay. He went. Yeah, that devil freaking out today. <laughs> if you can see in the spirit realm, there are angels surrounding me and demons trying to get in. Shut him up! Shut him up! Kill him! Pull his hair! Shut him up! <laughs> and angels are over there doing a hemsy hammer. You can't touch this. No, 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 all around him. <laughs> he went to villages and healed, Jesus healed them all. Nobody was saved. And then on one occasion, he went to a village, and the Bible says he could not do many marvelous works because of their unbelief in him. Now go to Hebrews chapter 9. Let me show you something here. Now, if this is your first time in our church, you're probably freaking out like, I feel like I'm in a classroom. You are. You're in a classroom. I, I don't holler because it messes my throat up. I don't scream because I get a headache. I do that when I get excited, but I always pay for it when I get home. I, I just... <laughs> All right, now, now listen to this now. Hebrews chapter 9, verse 12 through 14. Neither by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. For if the blood of bulls, now he's talking about sacrificial offerings, if the blood of bulls or of, and of goats and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling the unclean sanctifieth to the purifying of the flesh, how much more shall the blood of Christ who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot to God, how much more can he purge your conscience from dead works to, to serve the living God? Dead works. What are dead works? Dead works are the works that you do to try to deserve what God has for you. And it says your conscience, the blood of Jesus, 
wants to purge your conscious from the dead works. You in your conscious thinking, I have to do something to deserve it. And that's religion. Don't you see? That's church. You know, if you don't believe me, take next week off. Pick a church. Do it on Wednesday. Pick a church. <laughs> and just sit there. And it will be a work-based gospel. It will be a performance-based gospel which says you have to do this if you want God to do that. That's called dead works. It says you got to be good if you want God to be good to you. That's dead works. That's not grace at all. And when you do that, Christ has no effect. Nobody wants to hear that. You spend time praying, no effect in prayer life, no effective prayer life. You spend time doing whatever you do, but no effective, no, no effective prayer life because you keep doing things to earn it. It's dead works. It's dead on arrival. Look at uh, Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Romans chapter 10, verse 3. Falling into grace is falling into the law base condition. Okay? Condition. The law was conditional. It means you had to meet a condition in order to get the promise. That is true. Under the Old Covenant. Under the Old Covenant, there were conditions that you had to meet. And if you wanted to be blessed, then you would have to do this. If thou, that was the key, if thou, if thou. If you want to be blessed, if thou, if thou. But if thou not, you're going to either be blessed or cursed based on you meeting the condition or not meeting the condition. If you meet the conditions under the law, then you would be blessed. If you didn't meet the conditions under the law, you would curse, and a lot of people died because they couldn't meet the conditions because the condition was not able to be met. That's, right. That's why you died for complaining. Mm -hmm. I don't want this chicken dead. <laughs> Fall dead. <laughs> You'd have like, what I'm doing here? I just said I ain't like the chicken. Complaining. Oh, you went and sat down at the bottom of the mountain after he told you not to do it. You're dead. Because he was trying to show you when in Exodus 19 and 8, the word of the Lord came from Moses, and they responded like this, we can do it. We don't need God. We can do it. And literally, all hell broke loose with perfection. God says, I'm going to give you something so perfect that you cannot do, and I, until you come to an end of yourself, I got to prove to you, you can't do this. And there are churches today, I've heard preachers say, I keep all the commandments. There's 613 of them. You don't even know all of them. You don't even know all of them. Nobody has ever kept all the law except for one man, our champion, Jesus Christ. What is going on in the pulpit? It's like, oh, they think I'm nuts. Oh, this guy has lost his mind. <laughs> Talking about that the law <laughs> is the ministration of death. I didn't say that. The Bible said that. The Bible took that which was written on stone. What was written on stone? The Ten Commandments. He said it's the ministry of death. It's supposed to administer death because it's perfect and he's trying to show you that you can't do it. You can't do nothing but die because you can't keep this. This going to kill you because imperfect you trying to keep something that's fallen. What I wrote on stone is me. It's my character. It's my perfection. And you, 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 you that arrogant? You think you got it like that? I sent this to you to kill you. All right. That freaks people out to kill you, to bring you to an end of yourself, to knock you on your face until you say, okay, God, I need you. 
God came, God came down to speak to them, and they couldn't even bear it. It was driving them nuts, and they were begging him, please don't let him speak to us no more. We'll listen to Moses. You cannot stand in the perfection and the pure holiness of an awesome God after you have fallen into sin. You can't do that. So Jesus showed up to do what you could not do and said, now you come on into me and I'm going to get on the inside of you and we ain't got to hide behind no rocks. I'm going to be the presence of God in you and it ain't going to kill you, hallelujah, because I am your Savior. <sighs> Have we read Romans 10, 3 yet? Forty years ago, this would be a three-hour a three sermon, but I done got sense. <laughs> Some of y'all remember them three, two and a half, three hours, you remember them? Then people start praying, Lord, let him shut up, Jesus. <laughs> My wife said to me, she said, some of them can't hold but 15 minutes. Why are you going for two hours or something? <laughs> for they being ignorant of God's righteousness, and going about to establish their own righteousness. They have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. They fell from grace. Romans chapter 4, verse 2 and 3 in the NLT. Let's read this in the NLT. Oh, glory to God. Y'all getting this? Yes, if his good deeds had made him acceptable to God, he would have had something to boast about. But that was not God's way. For the Scripture tells us Abraham believed God and God counted him as righteous because of his faith not because of his works. I sure hope you're not trying to work your way to heaven. Sure hope you're not going to show up at the gates with a long list of all the goody, goody things you've done. You can't do that. That ain't going to work. And look at this, Galatians 2.16 in the uh, NLT. I got eight more minutes. Thank God for that clock. You should really be thanking God for that clock. <laughs> and my, my commitment to stick with it. When it hit zero, I hit zero. Yet we know that a person is made right with God by faith in Jesus Christ, not by obeying the law. And we have believed in Christ Jesus so that we might be made right with God because of our faith in Christ, not because we have obeyed the law. For no one will ever be made right with God by obeying the law. I don't even know how to make the, You don't even need to comment on that. And so what happens? Church folks go to church. The first thing they want to do is try to figure out how to put some rules on somebody. Well, now that you're saved, <laughs> what's the name of that place we pass on the way to the game every Sunday? That club? Yeah, 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 yeah. Can't go to Magic City no more. <laughs> Now, true enough, going to Magic City is not going to be good for you. I am not saying, <laughs> see if the Spirit of God is working in you, changing your desire, the desire for Magic City is going to be changing. It is not, well, since we ought not be operating by rules, yeah, but you're operating something greater than rules. You're operating by the Spirit of God who writes it on your heart. 
You're operating by the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God is writing on your heart. You will now begin to do things by uh, intuition. You, you, it'll be out of your heart. Oh, well, I can't talk. I, I, talk talking to her like that is just not nice. Yes. 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 Going here wouldn't be good for me. Watching this, that, that's going to in, infect something that, I, that the Spirit of God wants to say to me. The Spirit of God will start talking to you. Quick, coming to preachers. My pastors ain't got time to be sitting up there listening to you. Does God mind if you drink wine? Ask Jesus. <laughs> you know what you want? You want some rules. You got delivered from the law so you can go back to being justified by the law. What's happening? You're falling from grace. Nobody's saying that they're not going to be healthy rules over your life, but you know where they're going to come from? The Spirit of God. The Spirit of God may tell you to do something and may not say the same thing to another person because he knows where your weakness is because he knows everything. He knows this ain't going to be good for you. He knows that don't bother you at all. It, it, it ain't got a chance. But we want everybody to be subject to the same rules, and it failed miserably. That's why he gave you the Holy Ghost, so he can administer all the results of the, of, of, uh, of, uh, the, of, of the commandments of God. See, there's, somebody says, we ain't got no commandments. Yes, you do. You have a great commandment. Walk in love. And when you love, then you won't do this. And when you love, then you won't do that. And when you love, the Holy Spirit will talk to you about doing that. And when you love, you'll do that. And we don't, we don't want to take the time to develop relationship with the Holy Spirit and to trust the Holy Spirit. We don't want to do that. We want a rule that's just simple. What's the rule? Can we drink or not? <laughs> You're looking for some church to tell you, can you drink or not? Like you finna go get toe up right now. I finna go get me a bottle of Cavassier right now, boy. Reb said it's all right to drink. I think he, I think he was a little drunk when he was telling us that to you. Stop. <laughs> this is about a relationship. Yes. A relationship that's calling for your time. A relationship that's calling for your dedication. A relationship that's calling for your devotion. Yes. Yes. A relationship that's calling for your body. Give your body as a living sacrifice. But before he said, give your body as a living sacrifice, he says, I beseech you by the mercies of God, because he knew you can't give your body as a living sacrifice without first of all recognizing that there's got to be mercy. Because when you don't have mercy, you have judgment and condemnation. And when you have judgment and condemnation, you sin more and more and more. Well, <laughs> lady told me one time, she said, I like the way you used to preach. I don't know about this grace stuff. <laughs> you don't know about Jesus because Jesus is this grace stuff. I'm not promising you that you're going to walk out of here and everything's going to, voila, be fixed. And we shout loud, oh, God's going to give us life and give it to us more abundantly, and it means so much more than stuff. He literally came and gave you life out of death. And he gave it to you in abundance to the full, till it overflows. The thief came to kill, steal, destroy. Look at what he did in the Garden of Eden. Jesus says, I've come out of all of that death to give you life. And how come we reduced it down to just give me some more money, give me some more material, give me some more of that? What, what is that? That's the cheaper instead of the deeper. Yes, he wants you to prosper in every area of your life, but he came to give you life. We should be shouting because we ain't going to hell no more. Amen. He came to give us life. Who can take life out of death? 
Who can take something that's dead and, and put life in it? And all of us were on our way to hell. Everybody was. Ain't that now one of you in here qualified not to go to hell? Everybody was on their way. Well, I didn't sin as much as he did. It don't matter, because sin is sin. You just had a little smart mouth. Sin is sin. <laughs> when we fall from grace, uh, yeah, Lord, you remember that uh, woman with the issue of blood? Spent all she had on doctors. Here it is again. When she was fresh out of her supply, she touched the hem of his garment and accessed the supply that Jesus had. It's all over the Scripture. Sometime I say, God, show me, show me where I'm relying on a supply somewhere in my life. For me, it was supplements. I could just bet on that I'd be healthy and live 100 years because I'd taken all these supplements until it, it didn't. I'm like, how am I going to have COVID, shingles, and cancer taking all of these supplements, eating the way I eat, exercising the way I exercise? I should be the most healthiest person in the world. I fell from grace. I was dependent on that. Can't do that no more. Now, I'm not saying. <laughs> Pastor Dawson said, don't take no supplement because you fall from grace, you take supplements. <laughs> I mean, help me, people. Help me just a little bit. <laughs> you can take anything dependent on God. But my dependence on God had weakened and my strength for supplement had strengthened. I take a few still today, but I don't trust them because I know that all power ain't in this pill. All power is in Jesus Christ. Ooh, that's, that's, that's all the time I got. That's zero, 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 six times. Did you get anything out of this? Every head bowed, every eye closed. We'll, we'll pick up with it later. Father, we thank you that in the name of Jesus, we have a Savior that has effect in our lives. Not by our works, not by our performance, but by our faith and belief in who you are. Help us, Lord. Let us not fall from grace and allow the root of bitterness to spring up in us. And then one day something pops up in our life and we didn't even know it was there. Minister to every person at the sound of my voice. Show them your way. We could not do this without you. And Father, I think that's the message, to trust you. Well, we need, we need help to do that, Lord. We've heard so much religion all of our lives. And the generation that we're in now, Lord, help them not to go there. Help them to, to see this and help them to take this move of grace to a place that, that I could never take it. Every heart we present to you, help us, Lord. Help us, Lord. We declare our dependence upon you, not our self-effort, not our performance, not our works, but we receive your grace 
and we boast on you because it's in him we move and breathe and have our very being. We give you praise. We give you praise. Now, Father, speak to our hearts on what you'd have us to give. Let us no longer be afraid of giving when your word keeps talking about it over and over again. Bring unto the Lord glory. Give unto the Lord glory. Do unto his name. Bring an offering. Worship him in the beauty of his holiness. You keep saying over and over again. And we trust that you take care of us and deliver us from mammon. And may we give with a cheerful heart, a heart that trusts you. That our giving is our worship to you. And as we prepare to worship you, we pray that you receive it. We will not fall from grace. In Jesus' name, amen. If you need an offering envelope, raise your hands. The ushers will get one to you. I hope you're seeing over the last few Sundays, I am consistently trying to tie your giving in with your living. It's not separate. It's not, oh, the show is over with. Let's take up an offering. It's a worship to give unto the Lord. It's a worship to give generously unto him as he has done unto us. And when we begin to see this as a worship, we begin to see this as a necessary part of our lives. Give to the Lord. Some people, all their lives, are going to just see it as, well, it's just money. It's just money. No, 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 no. That money represents my time and my sweat. And the Bible says, all things come of thee, O Lord. So what I give to God was he is already, he just wanted to see if I was going to worship him with it or if I was going to do it, worship myself with it. Yeah. This thing's coming to a close, yeah. You know, an election's coming up in this country, it's gonna get crazy. And we gotta pray. There are all kinds of demon spirits that are loose. All of the isms are loose. But the word says, as for me and my house, we're gonna serve the Lord. And that's what we're gonna do. That's what we're gonna try to do is keep you focused on Jesus Christ. And when chaos increases, grace will increase more. When sin abounds, grace will abound more. It's on you. It's on you. I don't have anything left to do on the planet except to teach the gospel of grace. And I mean, I'm going to teach it. <laughs> I'm trying to find me a team that's going to be bold enough. I want to go to all 50 states it's going to take me four years to do it. I'm going to remember that. It's going to take me four years. It's going to take me four years to do it. And to preach this gospel of grace to whoever come. 500, 1,000, 10,000, I don't care. I might end up in some cities. I, don't, I, I feel like I, I got to, to, I just, before this is over with, I want to make sure that this gospel has been preached in every state. Wyoming, Idaho, <laughs> North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska. Nebraska. <laughs> I'm gonna have to get some white folks on my team because I'm gonna have to send some <laughs> white folks ahead of me. <laughs> I'm gonna have to name one of them Creflo. The Bible says when this gospel, this gospel, has been preached throughout all the world, 
then the end will come. I'm ready to rock and roll. And I'm telling you, don't, don't dog out this, 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 this generation. I don't know what they call themselves now, the, the generation that's in right now. They, what, what they call? Gen Z. They're they going to rock and roll. Y'all better watch out. They are going to usher in such a glory of God because they are, they are, they are not going to just listen to any kind of nonsense. Bishop Fuller said something we were doing a podcast this week. He said, the biggest enemy to a new movement is the old movement. I said, boy, Ken and I said, that's a Kenny Fuller special right there. Boy, that's another one right there. Trying to keep the evolution going. Now, Jesus is not evolving and changing. Our understanding of him is doing that. So. Let's go ahead and receive our offering. Father, we thank you for the opportunity to sow and to give generously into the things of God. We praise you for it. We praise, praise God for every promise that you have given concerning this. And we ask in Jesus' name that as we are generous unto you, the generosity keeps coming from grace to grace to grace. It's in your name we pray and everybody say it, amen. Go ahead and receive the offerings right now and trust God. Trust God. Regardless of what happens in the financial realm, trust God. God's going to take care of you. It's hard to give when you don't believe that God can take care of you. But when you believe that God can take care of you, giving is something that you do freely. Amen. As the offerings being received, those of you who are not born again, those of you who have not made Jesus the Lord of your life, those of you who have not received the grace that has been made available to you, I would like to give you that opportunity now. If you want to make him your Lord and personal Savior and receive what he has done for you, you can come and meet me down to the altar. Secondly, if you want to recommit yourself to the Lord Jesus, you're saying, God, I don't know what happened to our relationship, but I, I sure want to get it started back up again. You meet me at the altar right here. Thirdly, if you've not received the baptism in the Holy Spirit with the evidence of speaking in tongues, and you want to receive the Holy Spirit into your life, come on. And last, last but not least, if you believe this is the brook that God has called you to, he said, go to a certain brook and there will I sustain thee. If you believe that God's calling you to join this church today, you just got to simply just walk out what you believe he's telling you to do. Got to start practicing what he tells you to do. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you. Just want to tell you, Lord, I love you more than anything. I love you, Jesus. I worship and adore you, just want to tell you, Lord, I love you. I love you, Jesus. 
That's all, that's all the life of grace is. That's all the life of grace is. Just making your mind up that I'm going to stay in love with Jesus. Okay, so maybe you can't figure it all out right now. But I trust Jesus. And maybe you've fallen and fallen and fallen, but I, I keep getting up trusting Jesus. And maybe you're hurt and sad, maybe even a little bitter, but I trust Jesus. And maybe one day you'll come to the place where you can make this commitment to him. I'm never going to quit. I'll never quit on you, Lord. I'll never quit on you. How many of you say that today? I'll never quit on you. I'll never quit on you. He could have quit on us when he was getting beat with a cat of nine tails. He could have quit on us when they were nailing him to the cross. He could have quit on us in the pit of hell and said, this is just too much. Yeah, everything's going to be all right, God. Father, for those who come to this altar, I pray. Whatever needs to happen with these precious lives, we trust you, Lord. Do it. We praise you for it now in Jesus' name. Amen. Uh, if you'll turn this way and follow this gentleman to the prayer room, he's going to take you and give you a biblical understanding of how to obtain and how to maintain what you came to receive. We thank God that you're never going to be the same again. You can stand for our final blessing. Thank you so much for coming out to church today and not listening in and looking at all the clouds in the sky. <laughs> You're a blessing. And now unto him, unto the spirit of grace that will assure us that we have grace upon grace, that will assure us that we have abounding provision. I pray that those provisions will abound and I declare over your lives grace upon grace upon grace. I declare and I pray that the angels of God will carry out the command of God to watch over you and to protect you lest you dash your foot against the stone. I pray that when you need a miracle, you'll have one. I pray that in the name of Jesus, that the doctor's bad report will be turned around and you'll hear a good report and declare that something good is going to happen to you this week. And now unto him who is able to keep you from falling and to present you faultless before the almighty God, 
be glory, majesty, dominion, and power, both now and forevermore. May the blessings of God run you over this week. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you. Have an amazing day today.